Our reading this morning is Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who've died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or well, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we'll certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness but rather offer yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you're not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you've come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You've been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I'm using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. It was the theme tune to the 1963 film called The Great Escape. Still a hugely popular film among British television audiences, a particular favourite of the sort of Christmas TV schedules. It was based on a real escape that took place during the Second World War from a German prisoner of war camp, supposed to be a high security prisoner of war camp. I believe 300 prisoners were involved in building some tunnels from the living quarters of the prisoners out underneath the fence and supposedly into a, a, an area of woodland beyond the fence. The actual escape took place, in fact this is an interesting fact, 80 years ago today. Well, I thought it was interesting anyway. <laughs> They, they intended um, a, 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 great num a greater number of um, prisoners to escape, but in fact only 76 uh, of the prisoners of war were, were able to pass through the tunnel and um, find their way to freedom. So it was truly a remarkable escape story, except 
that of the 76, 73 of the escapees were recaptured over the next couple of weeks. And of those 73, 50 were later shot in the hope of discouraging further such attempts. The only surviving escapees were two Norwegians and a Dutch national. So not quite like the, uh, the film. This morning, I'm going to tell you about not one, but two escape stories in the Bible of far greater scale and considerably more significance to humanity. Really speaking, they're not just escape stories, but they're rescue stories. And the rescuer is God. We're continuing in our series on God's good news, seeking to grow in our understanding of what God's good news is and our understanding of the, of the ways in which it's relevant to the world around us, a world that really needs good news. And today's theme is God's freedom. But first of all, where do we find ourselves in the Bible? We're touching down in Romans, in the middle of Paul's most complete explanation of the gospel. In the preceding chapters, Paul has identified humanity's fundamental problem being that of sin. In other words, our failure to live in the way that God originally intended for us. A sinful way of life is at odds with God's perfect character. This is what mankind needs to be rescued from. This is the problem besetting humanity. We are all under the power of sin. Chapter 5, the, the chapter immediately preceding our passage, tells us that we cannot deal with the problem of sin by an, obeying a code of law. Instead, we are made right with God by a gift from God. Salvation, or rescue, if you like, comes to us by the grace of God. And the greatness of our sin and unfaithfulness only serves to underline the greatness of God's grace. Now, Paul knows that people are going to struggle with the idea of salvation being a free gift of God, and he describes their ob objections like this in verses 1 and 15. The two objections go something like, if we go on sinning, isn't that a good thing because it allows God to demonstrate even greater generosity? And the second objection in verse 15 is slightly different. If the law doesn't apply to us anymore, if obedience to the law isn't the thing that makes us right with God, doesn't that give us freedom just to sin as we please? These objections remind me a bit of the problem with insurance policies. If, for example, I buy a policy to protect my home and protect myself financially in the case of accidental damage, then isn't there a danger I might become less worried about the consequences of damaging my home and therefore becoming more careless or worse. I had a colleague many years ago who proudly told me that he always made a couple of insurance claims every year to ensure that he'd covered the cost of his premiums. <laughs> so a broken ornament here, a damaged carpet there, and he soon made his money back. He was effectively testing the generosity of his insurance company. So, how does Paul answer these objections? Well, Paul basically thinks that anyone who raises such objections firstly doesn't understand the process by which God has set them free, and secondly, does not understand the nature of the freedom they have been given. So just to be clear, the freedom I'm talking about here is the freedom from, from the power of sin. So in the, the actual passage, he explains firstly how God sets people free from sin, so that's verses 2 to 10, and then he explains what freedom from sin means for the people of God, and that's verses 12 to 23. So let's look at the first one of those. How does God set us free? I need to start by stating that our freedom is not bought like an insurance policy. It's not a transaction. It's not a simple exchange of something that we can do 
in exchange for uh, some future expectation of safety. No, our freedom is a rescue story, which Paul explains using the idea of baptism. Now, one way of looking at baptism is as the symbolic reenactment of the story of our salvation. It's a drama in two acts. First act is going down into the water, and then second act rising up out of the water. And these two acts represent leaving behind one kind of life through the process of death, and the second is rising to a new life through the process of resurrection. Whose death and whose resurrection are we talking about? Well, firstly, of course, that of Jesus. And in a few days' time, we'll be marking Jesus' death and resurrection with our Good Friday and Easter celebrations. And baptism represents these events, but with an addition. It also represents our own death and resurrection as we, by faith, become united with Jesus in his death and resurrection. I said this was a rescue story. We are being rescued from the control that sin has over our lives and we are being brought into a new life. In fact, it is the greatest rescue story ever told because anyone, anyone who calls on the name of Jesus can be saved through this process. Just to help us further understand what is going on here, I want to tell you another rescue story. In fact, this rescue story is the second greatest rescue story ever told, and it concerns the rescue of the Israelites from the land of Egypt, the Exodus story. Do you remember the story? Bobby alluded to it earlier on when she mentioned the Passover, which was part of the escape from Egypt. The people of Israel have been enslaved by the Egyptian pharaoh. He was intent on eventually destroying the Israelites. He decreed that all the firstborn sons of Israel would be killed at birth. So obviously Israel would eventually disappear as a nation as they died out. But God takes pity on the Israelites and raises up a rescuer for them by the name of Moses. And his job is to lead the Israelites out of Egypt back to the land that God originally promised to their forefathers many generations ago. Eventually, through a series of miraculous signs of which the Passover was one, Moses is able to persuade Pharaoh to let the Israelites leave Egypt. And the Israelites, by now a vast horde of people, begin their journey east out of Egypt. But, just to add some tension to the story, the Egyptian pharaoh soon regrets his decision and begins to pursue the Israelites with his army. Before long, the Israelites find themselves trapped between the pursuing army and a body of water, which most translations refer to as the Red Sea. It looks like there's no way out. The Israelites are beginning to doubt the wisdom of their flight from Egypt. Death seems inevitable, either reverting to slavery under the Egyptians, but with the slow destruction of their people, or are they going to be slaughtered here on the banks of the Red Sea? However, they have put their faith in God's rescuer, Moses, and God enables Moses to open up a path through the middle of the sea, and with Moses, they march through the waters to safety on the other side, while the waters close behind them over their pursuing enemies. They are free, free to begin a new life as the people of God. It's one of the most dramatic stories in the Bible. So what are the parallels with the baptism rescue story? We're not a slave by Egyptians intent on our destruction, but we are enslaved by sin, sin which leads to our eventual destruction. On our own, we cannot break away from sin's pattern of behavior or its inevitable consequence, death. The Israelites have with Moses faced death in the waters of the Red Sea. In baptism, we actually share with Jesus in his death through the symbolic waters of baptism. 
And so the Israelites, once on the other side of the Red Sea, are effectively dead to the Egyptians. The Egyptians have lost their power over the Israelites. And once we go through the waters of baptism, we are effectively dead to the realm of sin. Sin has lost its power over us. And in both cases, there is a need to put one's faith in someone, to follow someone into the waters as if our very life depends on it. You need a rescuer. For the Israelites, God's rescuer is Moses. For us, God's rescuer, the one who will lead us to freedom, is Jesus. If you have never trusted Jesus in this way as your rescuer, can I commend him to you? as one who is trustworthy to rescue your life and lead you to freedom. So that's the baptism picture. And then in verse 11 of the chapter, we read, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. In other words, it's saying, take stock, do the calculations, stand on the far bank of the Red Sea and look at where you've come from, the land of slavery and death. Look how you got here through the waters of death and resurrection and look at where you are now, free from slavery to sin. Think about these things if you're tempted to be complacent about sin, to think, well, God will forgive. We have been rescued sin. It makes no sense to go back there. So that's the first part of Paul's argument, the process by which we come to freedom. And the second part is, what does it mean to be free? Now, I think in this day and age, the language used in verses 16 to 22 is a really hard sell. Because rather than contrasting slavery and freedom, it makes a comparison between two different kinds of slavery. That sort of imagery would have been very helpful to the first readers of this passage because slavery was so commonplace in the Roman Empire. But people today value freedom, particularly the kind of freedom that places a premium on my personal autonomy. As long as it doesn't harm anyone else, I am free to be and do what I want. We don't want any kind of slavery. But this passage talks about either being slaves to sin or slaves to righteousness. It seems we're either in one camp or the other. The opening track of Bob Dylan's album, Slow Train Coming, was called Gotta Serve Somebody. And the chorus went, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Bob Dylan is reflecting the verses here in the second part of chapter 6 of Romans. The contrast of these two slaveries is stark. Slaves to sin are free of the control of righteousness um, and, and it is a slavery that has guaranteed wages, death. Slaves of righteousness, on the other hand, are set free from sin and are blessed with the gift of God, eternal life. The important thing about these two kinds of slavery is where they're both leading. Life or death? Let me tell you about my own latest enslavement. I have recently become a slave to Duolingo German. Now, Duolingo, if you haven't heard of it, is a web-based language learning system that teaches with a series of inbuilt positive feedback mechanisms, you know, the kind of things, virtual rewards, league tables, cheerful graphics, and plenty of encouragement. I have chosen to learn German because I want to be free to speak to the father-in-law of my son, Jonathan. He's called Matthias, and unlike his wife, Kirsten, he doesn't speak much English. I tell you this not to illustrate either slavery to sin or slavery to righteousness, but just to show how giving yourself over to something submitting to a discipline, submitting to an authority, can lead to greater freedom. In this trivial case, the freedom to converse with someone from another culture. 
the right kind of slavery can lead somewhere good. In terms of the Christian faith, slavery to righteousness, in other words, submitting ourselves to the way of life that God originally intended for us, leads to life. And I'm not just talking about eternal life when we die. This life begins the moment someone is joined to Christ. The life that I'm talking about is peace with God. It's healthy relationships. It's peace with ourselves. It's harmony with the world that we live in. BBC Radio 4, yes I know not everyone listens to Radio 4, but has a very cheerful, engaging couple of of Irish presenters called Marion Keyes and Tara Flynn. And they've recently been training a programme aimed mainly at women, but it promises, this programme promises in the trail, to go to places where women live their best lives. That phrase caught my ear because living our best lives is a genuine modern preoccupation, not just for women, both men and women. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, has some important things to say about living our best life. How do people live their best lives? Firstly, by being free from slavery to sin and its ultimate consequences, death. Set free by being joined together with Jesus in his death and resurrection. Secondly, we live our best lives by learning that true freedom is found in submission to the teaching and authority of Jesus Christ. There's a lovely line in the church's liturgy somewhere that says, to serve God is perfect freedom. So let me finish with this as a prayer for us. Almighty God, in whose service lies perfect freedom, teach us to obey you with loving hearts and steadfast wills, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God has blessed our church with many, many fantastic people, and here you all are sat before me, and we're just so grateful for everyone. The huge percentage of people in this church who serve on some rotor, or even if they're not on a rotor, they do so much to serve Jesus in this place. Sometimes we have the sad situation where God moves someone on. And that's our case today. We're going to say goodbye to Margaret Tucker and just want to ask you to come out and tell us a little bit about how the last 37 years have been and what you're moving on. You think it's more? That's what you told me, 37. Uh, Do you want that one? I have this one. Okay, yeah. So, Margaret, you said more than 37, you reckon? Yeah, um, I was at confirmation service in 87. Wow. At St. Stephen's, so... And so what are the things that you've been involved with in over all of those years, Margaret? Oh, um, tea and coffee, baking cakes, providing meals uh, on the Alpha course. Um, I was on the estate management committee, pastoral care, prayer ministry, PCC, warden, missions committee, messy church, welcoming, knit and natter. <laughs> so much. I think she missed out making puddings for lunch club as oh, well. <laughs> You've given so much. Tell us how you've experienced God in this place. Oh, wow. Um, Well, God's enabled me for sure. Absolutely. Um, I've enjoyed uh, every activity that I've been part of. But seeing God in this place, really, I go back to the church centre when I first started. And when I walk through the door, um, I felt this amazing warmth and love and there were no icons around the room. And people were wearing jeans, you know, and it was Sunday. Um, I had a Catholic background. So to me, this was, um, this was lovely, and the people were so lovely. And uh, it's only when I look back that, you know, that was the spirit of the Lord amongst each and every one of you here. And then, to me, God's amazing work was in building this church. The fundraising that went on was phenomenal. And we had such a huge amount of money to raise. And how we did it, the Lord only knows. But who built this, you know, through all of you 
and all the fundraising and the work everybody did. So it seemed impossible. We, we know with God nothing's impossible. So to me, that is, it's that growth from the church center into Christ Church. And I remember being on the Estates Management Committee and we've got these rooms that were empty and we're thinking, goodness me, what are we gonna do with these rooms? Now it's a bit of a joke now, isn't it? Because they're full. They're full and they're used, you know, and um, it's a very special church. And I would encourage all of you just to try and get involved in some small way because that, that brings you all to, it's, you get to know people. It's just lovely. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's serving tea or coffee or saying hello on the, the front door. Um, God will enable you. And I think I said, I must remind myself, the, the Lord doesn't call the equipped. He equips those he calls. And I remember talking to Bishop Morris Sinclair about mission and saying, I don't really know what I'm going to do out there. I just feel God's nudging me. And he said, whatever you do, God will bless you. And he was absolutely right because everything I've got involved in, the Lord has blessed me and enabled me to grow in the knowledge and the love of Christ. I feel I've been very blessed being part of this church and each and every one of you has enabled me to grow as a Christian. And uh, the other thing that uh, has been a real blessing is home groups. If you're in a home group, you will know how great home groups are and how supportive they are. So if you're not part of a home group, I really would encourage you because I've had some wonderful people and you, you're just journeying with them and the Lord. And it's that level of support that you get throughout your Christian life, which is wonderful. You alluded to so. mission briefly. Oh, yes, then. that's my yeah, passion. Tell us, tell us uh, <laughs> you've not just served us here, served God here. Where else have you No, I, I went out to Bolivia. There was about 12 of us, and I think Chris, don't know if Chris is here this morning, but uh, hello, brother. Um, Chris was there too, um, as were several of us, and it was a great trip, and we did things that I never thought we would do, praying on the streets and all sorts. It was wonderful. And I went out to Africa. My heart is in Africa, really. I've been out there twice, and it's a very challenging trip. It really is a challenging trip. But for any of you that are thinking about it, I'm happy to chat to you about it. My voice holds up, yeah. We haven't booked our tickets yet, so there's still an opportunity if you want to sign up. <laughs> we'll be going in September. I would, if I hadn't have had what's going on this year, I would be there with you, <laughs> uh, maybe next year. But, um, but Africa changed me completely. It, it's never left me. I don't take things for granted like I used to before. You know, having a shower of a morning, electricity. I think of what people are doing there and they have to walk miles to get water. It's just, it's wonderful. Yeah, and uh, it's enriching. That's the thing, it's enriching. And it's enriching to see how uh, other Christians in other parts of the world are living their lives and living out their faith, whether it's in Bolivia, in Africa, in Cyprus, uh, Tanzania, wherever. Yeah. That's great. But God's moving you on, Margaret. He Tell us, is. Um, he where is. you've moved to and so what your I'm, plans are. Uh, I've, I'm living in Four Oaks at the moment with my daughter, and I'm moving into my little bungalow on Thursday. I'm looking forward to that and getting settled. Um, I've moved to be near the family. And one of the big things was actually leaving Christchurch because it's such a wrench. And then, I, you know, I felt the Lord saying to me, you know, you, you can do this. And there will be other churches there. There will be other good Christians. And I've met some already. And they're, they're wonderful. It's just finding the right place. And, um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's where I'm going. Heading for a new church, really. That's my big plan at the moment and i'm confident that god will use you there as well margaret wow. you've been such a blessing to this place what can we pray for you as you move on uh well obviously a church please yes i pray that god will lead me to the right church and that i can uh, have a home group okay yeah and good fellowship and that my health right because my voice isn't right yet right, right. yeah that the hospital will help me in getting right right, right, right. Great. Okay, I just wonder um, if there is anybody who would like to come and join me to uh, pray for Margaret as we send her on.
Father, I want to uh, thank you for Margaret. And Father, I want to thank you for the privilege of being able to go with Margaret to Kenya twice and to just see how you used her in that place and to see her grace even when there were bed bugs. I just <laughs> pray that you'll bless her and uh, be with her as she moves on and that she won't be forgotten and hopefully she'll visit. So we just love you, Margaret, and we thank God for you. Thank you. There is a, a card on the table for Margaret. Please sign that. I'm sure many of us have been blessed by uh, Margaret's ministry here. We also have flowers for you. I don't have enough hands. Oh, God. Oh, they're beautiful. Oh, look. Thank you. They are a token, but hopefully they will survive till Thursday to be pride of place in oh, your new bungalow. Thank you. Don't make me cry. <laughs> <laughs>